Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware that each of your line is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions electronically anytime by using the chat pod located to the right of your webinar platform. You may also download a copy of today's presentation using the files pod located directly below the presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to our first presenter, Meetal Patel. Thank you so much. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Hopefully everyone is doing well. My name is Meetal Patel. I am part of the AHA Center for Health Innovation. Uh, I have the honor of being your moderator today. Uh, thank you for joining us for this week's AHA team training webinar on mindfully addressing high reliability's robust PI for multi-level, multi-organizational, enterprise-wide improvement. Um, before we get into this meaty topic, just a couple housekeeping items. Um, rules of engagement, there's a couple different ways for you to access audio if you're having some issues. One is, of course, through your, your computer and the Adobe platform. But if that's finicky, we also have a, a phone option there for you. Um, you can see the, the dial-in information in the notes pod uh, to the right of the screen. We're holding some time at the end of session for Q&A. Uh, we got some pre-submitted, which is fantastic, but if others come to mind as we walk through the presentation, uh, please put them in the chat and uh, we will do our best to get those answered uh, at the end of the program here. As a reminder, um, this course, this webinar does qualify for one hour of CE credit. You have to take two steps to get this credit. Um, first one is if you don't have a Duke One Link account, it's to create an account. Um, you have to confirm your mobile number there because there is the second step here is to text SOCDOC to the number that you have on the screen. Um, so make sure if you're going for that CE credit to, to accomplish those steps um, before you forget. Uh, we also put that code um, and the text number in the notes pod. So if we move when we move off of this slide, um, that information will be in there for you. A quick note on upcoming HA team training events. Um, we have a few webinars coming up for you here uh, as soon as next week on using technology with patient and family communication. Um, the week after on reducing noise, and then one in November, November uh, a sneak peek to our uh, Advancing Care Conference. Um, a note on the Advancing Care Conference, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, um, this has been rescheduled to March 7th through the 9th. Um, registration will reopen uh, Monday next week. So um, look out for more details um, on that conference. That will be now in March. Um, lastly here, uh, we do like to continue this, this connection in community, so don't forget to join our Mighty Network platform. Um, and uh, what's nice about this presentation is all those links are live, so any link that you might see in this presentation, you can click on on your computer and it'll take you to where you need to go. All right. Now that we have the housekeeping out of the way, let's get into the exciting stuff. Uh, it's my honor to, to introduce our two presenters today. We have Elaine Huggins, who is the lead principal consultant for high reliability at Kaiser Permanente's national program office that's focused on quality, safety, experience, and health systems performance. Joining her is Pamela Leonard. She is the senior director at Kaiser Permanente National Patient Care Services, which is focused on quality, safety, and care experience. So let me get out of your way here and turn it over to Elaine and Pamela. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, as the presentation um, states, Elaine and I are happy to join to share our uh, work in mindfully addressing high reliability and robust PI across our organization. I'll tell you a little bit about us and our background. So, so if you don't know Kaiser Permanente, we're an integrated healthcare system made up of our health plan, hospitals, and our Permanente medical groups. We serve approximately 12.5 million members across the U.S. located in several states. 
Um, you can see our breakdown by each market. Um, our largest market is in California, but you can see we have um, several different regions or markets throughout the U.S. So, thanks for that, Pam. Our objective today is that we want to identify the three prerequisites and the five principles of high reliability in organizations. And then we want to analyze the classic eight-step problem solving, known as LEAN, and how this meets the needs of HRO robust process improvement in a mindful manner. We're going to describe our use of the cascading A3s in alignment of key stakeholders that highlights accountability of leadership commitment to no patient harm and supports high reliability principles across a multi-level, multi-organizational enterprise. And then we're going to consider the potential roadblocks and challenges that we experienced of doing multi-level organizational process improvement and various countermeasures we found that were available to us. So to give a little bit of background about um, how this journey began, um, it's focusing on one large PI initiative that was well underway prior to 2020. Uh, we have enterprise hospital patient safety goals that are benchmarked against national quality goals. And then our little pandemic happened, and we all knew that that threw us into a, a tailspin in March of 2020. Um, so when we first had our, our breathe, I guess, in September 2020, our national quality and nursing leaders um, came to us and asked us to, to really analyze our progress towards our goals, were there any considerations that we needed to um, be mindful of because of the COVID pandemic? Um, so naturally, we grounded this um, work using our HRO principles. So our focus for this initiative was on our nurse-sensitive quality measures for three of our HAIs. We're looking at our uh, FLABC, CADI, and CDF, as well as our two adverse event metrics uh, with falls with injuries and our happy. So this, again, was focus of our in our hospital work, so 40 hospitals in our four hospital markets in Oregon, California, and Hawaii. So to give a little background about um, how, do we, how do we approach this as a system, um, each market or region operates independently, yet we share system-wide quality and safety goals um, to rely on this, uh, to really work on a strategy. We have enterprise level committees that meet regularly to form our strategy. So this is often made up of smaller steering committees. Um, we also include subject matter experts from our stakeholders. So this is a, an example of how we um, developed a system-wide approach for our nursing quality work. Um, and then region, the region operations are actually doing the work. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over next to Elaine to really talk about the foundations of our HRO, HRO principles. Thanks, Pam. Now, when um, Pam and I got together, we realized we needed to go back to basics. And, and, um, and for this relook, we had to actually orient ourselves to the, uh, the principles and prerequisites and what did the you know, original authors of this say. So we actually went and looked at uh, Chase and Loeb's original articles in 2011. So when they were defining high reliability, they noted that we face the intersection of two interrelated trends. Hospitals house patients who are increasingly vulnerable to harm due to error, and the complexity of the care hospitals now provide increases the likelihood of these errors. And we were kind of seeing this to even a greater extent now with COVID. So they concluded that the only way to go forward was to seek high reliability in healthcare. So after doing a really great review of the quality journey, they went on to note that while the principles of high reliability had been defined by Wick and Sutcliffe in 2007, there were three prerequisites that needed to be established first in order to bring forth those principles. And those prerequisites were leadership engagement, safety culture, and robust process improvement. So we went back and looked at, at exactly what they're talking about. So the, the leadership commitment was 
basically this aligned agreement of the governing body. And it really started at the top, the Board of Trustees on down, down to your frontline nursing leaders, and the commitment to zero patient harm was key to this. And, and everybody involved really had to agree that zero patient harm was the goal. Then when they were talking about incorporation of the culture of safety, well, what was that? Well, they were talking about the model of Reason and Hobbes that came out in 2003. And really the principles of that was um, trust in the organization, trust uh, in order to report when things weren't going well, and then the, the, um, the expectation and experience of improving on that, uh, those reports. And then the second um, sort of uh, point that they noted was that they really needed to have integrated the principles of crew resource management, which we understand um, is actually team steps, or that's how team steps came about, was built on those principles. So that's kind of the, the two of those together were what they were talking about when they were speaking of a culture of safety. And last, of course, was robust process improvement. And what they pointed out was that we needed to apply a systematically attended to the uncovering of the very specific causes, the root causes of the failures of the safety processes. And by doing that, then we would really be hitting on that principle of reluctance to simplify that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So their point was is that if you wanted to bring in the principles of HRO, you really needed to have these prerequisites going, started, working on in the process. Now that's a lot of information to take in all at once. So we thought we would just do a little poll here. And we're curious as to what you all are thinking about these prerequisites. So the poll, remember, this is an opinion. If I could only implement and spread one prerequisite at a time, which one would I choose to go first? So we're watching the poll results come in. Looks like leadership engagement is running ahead. Yep. It looks like leadership engagement is the thing. And I, and I think mm -hmm. that's probably the experience. Wouldn't you say, Pam? Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we know we had to start with the top uh, to make sure that we, we were um, conveying the, the shared message. I completely agree. Yeah, it seems that way. All right, so let's talk about now these five principles. I know you're familiar with them, but let's go through them again. So first of all, you have your preoccupation with failure. So this is basically never being satisfied. Even though you haven't had something bad happen for quite a while, you still maintain that awareness of, of small signals that could indicate there's something wrong. And I often think of this you know, in our good catch or near-miss uh, reporting is where you really see that preoccupation. And then we have the resisting temptation to simplify. And of course, this is basically understanding that safety can be complex and that there's many different forms that problems can take. And um, being able to identify the subtle differences between threats, and this is where that root cause analysis comes in. And as you know, we found, I mean, you can be focused on falls, you can have falls happening, but honestly, the reason why those falls are happening can be very different depending on the organization or the situation that's going on. So resisting that temptation to simplify is important. Then we have the sensitivity to operations, and this is the recognition of the earliest indicators of possible of threat. And that, um, this is where the speak up culture comes, because you can recognize that small things are happening or, or that small things have happened, but if you don't report it, then it's not going to be worked on until something really bad happens. And commitment to resilience. And this is recognizing that despite all the best efforts and all past safety successes, errors will occur and safety will be threatened. And I really liked what Wick and Sutcliffe said. The hallmark of an HRO is not that it is error free, but that errors don't disable it. And last but not least is the deference to expertise. 
that mechanisms are in place to identify the individuals with the greatest expertise relevant to managing the new situation, and that decision-making authority will be placed with those. So it's kind of that shifting understanding of who actually knows what's going on and who's living with it every day. And that they address these five principles as, uh, you might say, collective mindfulness, or I like they called it a mindfulness infrastructure. The ultimate, and that is what leads us to highly reliable healthcare care Okay, again, this is a lot of information all at once, so let's do another poll just to help you think about this. So remember, again, this is, a, this is your opinion based on your experience. But if you could only implement and spread one HRO principle, which one do you think would have the most impact on decreasing patient harm? So let's see what folks are saying. This really takes some thought, I think, to, to con consider this. So it looks like preoccupation with failure. Now, there's a certain mindfulness to that, I think. And then uh, yeah, sensitivity to operations. That's that's very interesting. Yeah. OK, well, it looks like our folks are looking at preoccupation with failure as, as being um, really key in the whole thing. And this is kind of a nice segue, because in essence, that's what Pam and I did when, when we were asked to sort of relook at this project, is we were interested in sort of what um, what prerequisites and principles would be most important for us to focus on. So let's move on to sort of our observation. So first of all, we felt that that robust process improvement was going to be important because we understood that we needed a, a proven systematic method that would align the work that was going on insofar as looking at root causes and would allow us to communicate sort of between levels to ensure that we were getting an enterprise approach and understanding. We focused on uh, resisting the temptation to simplify because we have, you know, there we knew there was um, work going on and we wanted to really align it between markets and hospitals, but we wanted to appreciate the fact that there were going to be individuated root cause analysis going on at all levels, and we didn't want to miss that. We didn't want to... Uh, again, simplify and lose what was actually happening at the front line. And of course, like our group sensitivity to operations, we really wanted to uh, support the coordination that was going on, you know, both with data analytics, um, utilizing the tools and methods um, to identify sort of ongoing performance, you know, what was happening and so far as different targets. You know, we wanted also this consistent sharing of successful practices. So we did want that, that mindfulness going on of what everybody was doing. And then for us, um, deference to expertise was really key. Uh, we wanted to communicate regularly sort of the well-developed and regularly evaluated processes that, that were going on. The, the thing that we knew is that our nursing partners are the experts. So when we were looking at, at you know, the hospital-acquired infections or our harm incidents, you know, this is going on at the front line. Mm -hmm. This is going on at the unit, you know, day shift, evening shift, night shift, weekends. We knew that our nursing partners were the experts. So that's what we focused on in looking at how we were going to go forward. We decided that the way to address this was to look at um, eight-step problem solving, which we know is lean, and also to use the, the classic A3 template that goes with that. So Toyota, this is really the Toyota production process, eight-step problem solving. Um, it's there. Um, PDSA in um, really well developed that um, the P part of the first five steps. Of course, they've used this for years, and we've seen it used successfully in 
um, other hospitals and hospital systems. The A3 format, a way of communicating solutions concisely. Uh, the A3 itself is, is just the size of the paper that was used. It's a metric size of 11 by 17. And fortunately for us, our Kaiser Permanente Improvement Institute teaches the eight step problem solving, so we knew that this wasn't going to be anything you know, hugely new to use that. In fact, um, our institute has taught over 3,800 people on process improvement. About 33 of them are improvement advisors, and we've got about uh, almost 500 black belts throughout the organization. So they have um, the, the A3 that they use is lovely insofar as teaching folks how to use that, and they use this for a lot of frontline improvement. We felt that we wanted to go with something um, less, less focused on uh, teaching it and more focused on our operational leaders and just using it. So we use just a classic eight step where you start at the top, work through the steps. There's particular questions that you know need Yep. What was really cool about this is that we could use this in a cascading sort of effect. So we would start out with our enterprise level A3 working through the steps. And by the time we would get uh, to root cause analysis in step five, then we would uh, call upon our markets then. It became clear um, for them to start developing their A3, jumping off of ours, starting with the problem statement and working through um, their current state. And then if they wanted, they could actually bring this down to individual hospitals and ask individual hospitals to do A3 and eight-step problem solving. So we thought that this would really help with our alignment and understanding what was going on in our communication. So what Pam and I wanted to do now is just to run through, um, quickly identify what the steps are and, and what some of the potential roadblocks and um, problems that you can have with that and how we can counter those. We just wanted to share our experience with you. So step one is where you clarify the problem statement. Um, you actually write a problem statement, five sentences or less. And then step two is you, you break down that problem and you identify performance gaps. So for us, we just had a standard uh, sort of list of questions and it's kind of a journalistic effort. You know, what's the issue? Where is it occurring? When did it start? Who is impacted? It's, it's pretty straightforward. Now, some of the challenges uh, in doing that aren't so straightforward. I mean, first of all, this is a conversation, and we did have to engage uh, sort of the right people, the right stakeholders, and the right sponsors to make sure that, um, that we did indeed have that leadership commitment. Uh, identifying the scope to make sure that we don't have scope creep. Easy to do when you're looking at a project that, you know, two or three years in nature. Um, Obtaining consensus on the problem means that we did have to have conversations. Now, the beauty of that is sometimes it takes a little longer to write a good problem statement, but it does really encourage engagement and commitment once you come up with that problem statement that, that everybody agrees on. And for us, we needed then to form market teams that represented the people that were problem statement in their area. And again, it does mean opening up the problem statement and making sure that, that as it's written reflects how that particular market is looking at it. And then um, from there, supporting each of the market teams and starting their problem solving, making sure that their problem statement you know, is reflective of how they're actually looking at that. And then um, identifying a mentor for that A3 development is really important. And so that was a role that, um, that I played in helping folks to, to really get down to business and, and have these conversations. Set <laughs> two challenges. So from that problem statement, then we're getting into what you might say current, current state looking at data, looking at situations that were going on in the market. And here, we really did have to listen. So these were conversations where we didn't do a lot of talking. We asked a lot of questions, tried to understand. You know, each market had different challenges that were going on in relation to 
um, these five situations that we were looking at. And so we really needed to build a picture of what was going on in each market and not simplify it. We really needed to understand each market's perspective. So from there, um, step three is you set the improvement target. Now, to some degree, you know, with these particular, with the the um, infections and falls and stuff, it's 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 fairly straightforward. We used the standard template, and I think folks were pretty comfortable with that. I think, insofar as the challenges encounters, is you know. <laughs> Being in the situation, I think the first thing is that folks sometimes felt like, my gosh, is this ever going to end? Are we ever going to get to an endpoint? And in a way, uh, supporting that target setting says, yeah, when you hit this target, we'll be done with it. <laughs> but then there was that also that fear of failure. Well, what if we never hit the target? <laughs> um, that's when I think we just had to make it clear that, well, um, to some degree, this is a journey, and we're interested in, in you know, looking at um, what are the challenges to meeting the target. You know, maybe there's more to this than what we understand. You know, maybe there's more resourcing that needs. And so, I think what what we needed to establish and did establish is the sense of, yeah, we're not, you know, we're not coming in trying to tell you what to do or when you have to do it by. We with you on this journey and see if we can help. And, uh, and see what we can learn about it. Uh, there were market variations in, in targets, and I think you know, uh, recognizing that you know different things were happening at different times in the markets, you know, we were able to work with that. And I think what was really great too is as we got more information, you know, Pam was really wonderful in in sort of leading discussions about how COVID was affecting particularly our HA, HAIs and our national trend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Elaine, I'll just add a couple comments. Uh, so keep in mind, we when we did set these improvement targets, um, they were consistent with our national quality goals. Uh, we, of course, did not know the impact that uh, COVID-19 had on our HAIs when we started this in September of 2020. Yeah, we stayed the course. We did not adjust our, our uh, quality goals. Um, we know now um, there's literature that's, that's being published that um, compared to 2019 nationally, particularly CLABSI, the United States saw an increase of 46% in rates in Q3 and Q4. Uh, so we did note that um, on some of our slides, you'll see an example where you can really map you know, the, the COVID spikes um, with our data trends. But just that, that was really um, key discussions that we had throughout this journey. Yeah, thanks, Pam. Thank goodness you were there <laughs> to discuss these things. So then we moved into step four, where you determine root causes of the performance gaps. And step five is you prioritize those root causes and develop countermeasures or projects to those root causes. And then step six is where you're actually implementing the countermeasures. So some of the challenges along that line is I think it's just human nature, especially in the operational world, well, let's just fix that. And sometimes the time it takes to, to look at root cause analysis can be challenging. And, and the other thing that we found is sometimes the prioritization um, sometimes that was challenging because there was this sense of, my gosh, we've got to fix everything, and we've got to fix it now. And it, and it's, um, it doesn't have to be that way. And I think that um, having discussions about, uh, you know, the 80-20 principle and just the fact that, you know, everybody's impacted. There's not a whole lot of bandwidth uh, during COVID to, to be uh, doing a lot of fancy fancy steps along this line. So having the conversation that we can prioritize, um, and also we did have some standardized uh, fishbone diagrams that I think were helpful in so far as cutting down the time on the root cause analysis. We'll share that with you as we go on. We also kind of um, we learned as we've gone on that <laughs> we can still have fun doing this. And so we started using a product called Mural that we found is very helpful in, um, in just doing um, different things like fishbone diagramming and then um, 
um, as I said, we did template some of those root cause analysis to make it quicker. And of course, we had this benefit of, of having the Kaiser trained IAs and black belts in the market. And so uh, each of the market teams, you know, had folks like this assigned and that was very helpful. Having a central document holder, um, and, and that, um, that was me insofar as um, holding, you might say, the, uh, the most recent version of the A3s and actually working on those so that they didn't feel like that they had to necessarily get the A3 right. We were in discussions, we would write the A3s and then make sure that it was actually sane and looking the way that they wanted wanted it to look. And so I think that helped, uh, really helped develop re rapport in the course of, you know, working this. So um, this is just an example of, you might say, a templated root cause analysis. We were fortunate at the program level to have our um, infection prevention specialist sort of go back and find every root cause you could possibly have when it comes to cauti or CLABSI or C. Diff. And then we would share these with the markets and then they basically, this was, this was kind of a, you know, delete everything that doesn't uh, exist for you and then we gave them space to add anything that they felt, you know, had been missed. So we were able to really curate um, a true root cause analysis from each market's perspective as to what was going on. And we, it didn't take that long to do it. That was what was great. So then we moved into step five, and so they multi-voted, came up with their, their uh, sort of their top root causes, and then identified projects or countermeasures, if you will, that, that would um, work for them. And then moved into step six, where they got down as to who was going to be responsible for what and when and all of that. So uh, some of the challenges about that is, you know, um, we had to clarify what the report out schedule was. And folks, of course, are, you know, in a multi-level organization when you're reporting up to the next level, you want to know, um, you know, when that's going to happen and what what the expectations are, so we had to get that schedule out. But then, of course, just the fact of COVID and, and you know, the different ways we found um, being flexible, certainly in implementation dates and, um, and how those report outs were done was really key. Again, it was just, um, you know, once we were able to identify who was working on what, I think that that sort of eased the challenge a little bit. Uh, we really appreciated the use of RACI charts in that. So again, um, though I can't stress the, the need for rapport in, in working with folks and making sure that they know that, you know, we're on their side um, trying to support sort of this continuing work. So then at step seven, this is, this is when the work is happening and you're collecting data. Um, for us, we just used a, a standard way of presenting this is we'd use a run chart. We'd identify the target. Uh, if it was appropriate, we'd identify a median based on past data so that we could um, use some of the, the rules of probability and looking at um, uh, patterns of improvement. We'd identify when countermeasures were implemented. And, and this, um, over time, now that we're coming up on a year of doing this, um, these charts are starting to, to really tell the whole story of the work that's gone on behind the scenes in relation to the data that's coming out. So the key challenge encounter, as you might expect, is, you know, keeping the focus and maintaining the momentum because, you know, stuff happens and I think that's true in any large organization as new stuff comes up. And so for us, it's a matter of, you know, keeping the reporting schedule. Uh, we check in, maintain the, the rapport. A lot of times we would check in, not so much, you know, finding out, well, how's the work going on, but more like, well, what's going on? And, you know, how are you guys feeling? And yeah, sometimes it would be more of a chat than a check-in, but um, over time, I think, again, developing that rapport is really key in this whole work. 
Now, step eight, to be honest with you, I guess you could say we haven't come to the classic step eight because that's, you know, when things are finished, you hit your targets and you're wrapping up. Um, but we have found that we really had to start, you know, um, sort of celebrating the successes that we have and certainly uh, sharing the knowledge that we've learned in this last year of our journey. So we do have some different forms. Um, hmm. and I can pretty talk good at some of these. Yeah. So just to give you an example of how, how we kind of use this um, process to give real-time updates, uh, we use parts of the A3 uh, to give executive leadership updates. So if you look at that step seven, it shows you real-time performance data. It, it discusses, it, it identifies the countermeasures. So at any point, we always had um, up-to-date information um, pre-populated in our master A3 deck. So we didn't have to go back to the regions to ask, what's your current state? What are you working on? Um, what's been effective? Um, we really just already had it. Um, we also have several communities of practice where we meet um, regularly and discuss nursing quality, infection prevention, and that's when we could really get into the countermeasures that each region was working on, um, share some of their uh, best practices and results. And also in the beginning, Elaine and I, when we started this, we, we mapped out with the stakeholders uh, what type of communication plan is needed. So how can we um, inform them of these updates um, that coincided when we would have new data? And our data, you know, it was lagging a little bit because it's, it goes through um, CDC and it's, it's maybe three to six months lagging. Uh, but, but we also had uh, more real-time information coming at the hospital level um, where they, they were predicting their cardiac collapse rates. So that was important to draft out that communication plan. And then Elena is also working on what are the tools that are developed, how do we use some of our um, Project Management Tools, Symphony, and Smart Sheets. So, Elaine, do you want to speak to that part of it? Right. Well, um, we had actually been using Symphony uh, for our reporting, and in truth, now we're starting to see the, um, at least in Kaiser, Smart Sheets is becoming um, used. I think all the markets are actually using that, and so I think we're going to be transferring our information over there. Um, but that is definitely key. I think that helps people feel a little bit relieved that this isn't going to be lost, that we'll be able to always go back and, uh, you know, look at these A3s, learn from them. And, and another key thing, not only the, I think the project repository, but also being able to share some of the cool tools that people come up with in the courses. Um, you know, they're problem solving, and step six is often, you know, you try different things, and so that's something else we've been able to share with folks. Um, some of the IT fixes that have come up, um, Pam's been really good at being able to share that throughout the nursing community. So, I think we kind of want to wrap up with just some of our overall learnings. Um, first of all, I mean, this is a journey. We knew when we started we were probably looking at two to three years. I think when you're talking about, um, you know, multi-level, multi-organizational, to think you're going to do improvement in, you know, six months to a year, that it just doesn't give folks enough time. So we knew we were on a two to three year journey. And I, and, um, I think that's, that's key to, you know, when you're developing the report to recognize that, you know, it's not a uh, classic, uh, upward uh, trend of improvement. Sometimes, you know, there's fits and starts. You realize you have to go back and focus on root causes that maybe you didn't realize were that important or maybe weren't that important a year ago. So it, um, it is important to stay the course. I think the other thing that Pam and I have learned is it, certainly in this particular project, it is the frontline teams that are doing the work. There's just no doubt about it. You know, it's your, your evenings and nights, and they're actually, you know, working on improvement, but they're working on staying the course and um, keeping people safe and, and doing the basic 
you know, bundles that we know have to be done. I think you just, um, you can't say too much about the resilience of the staff. We've all seen it. I think everybody on this call, you know, being in healthcare, uh, the frontline staff that are taking care of our patients, these folks are, are just, they're committed. They're just committed. Yeah, and I can give a, a great example. I know we, we speak about resilience now more than, more than ever. Um, but just to talk about the resilience that we saw uh, in KP, um, two of our, well, we have our entire organization is on a magnet journey. So all of our hospitals and ambulatory areas are on the journey to achieve magnet over the next five years. And two of our hospitals were in the midst of this journey during COVID and were given the option of, of you know, we, we really don't need to um, push this right now. We have such complex environments of care, but they, they staff said, absolutely not. We're committed to this, committed to nursing excellence. So two of our large hospitals actually achieved um, magnet designation in 2020. Um, so that, that just speaks to the commitment to excellence that we're proud to share. <laughs> yeah, that says a lot. Great, great news. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I of course, the truth... thankful for. <laughs> go ahead. No, you go ahead, Sam. Uh, I think we both are. Oh no, the same. I'm just so proud when I when I when I see all of the accolades um, for all of our our healthcare workers and and Lena and I as we wrapping up. We just wanted to uh, really express our gratitude uh, for you all for joining this to hear a little bit of insights about how we approached our robust PI improvement work. And um, thanks to you for also supporting your frontline healthcare heroes. I know we have several organizations across the U.S., so we're just honored to be able to share this with you. Yeah, thanks for that, Pam. Also, just so you know, there's a little bibliography of, of sort of the original HRO writings. I think uh, if you're interested, that these are great reads. Uh, uh, the Wick and Sutcliffe, particularly, um, their book, the Managing the Unexpected, is pretty impressive. It's fun to read, even if you don't care anything about HROs. Anyway, so we are now open to questions. Thank you, Elaine, Pamela. That was, that was a, a rich, rich presentation. Um, we, we do have quite a few questions that have been coming in in the chat and others, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to, to get these over to you guys. Um, the first one uh, was asked in a couple different ways, so there's definitely a theme here, and, and the gist of it is how are you balancing, um, you know, this push to simplify? How are you balancing this push for, for process improvement? Um, with everything that our staff is dealing with on the front lines, um, obviously the pandemic still, shortages, et cetera. So um, th there were a few questions around, around this. Um, so it would be helpful to get your guys' thoughts on that. I think for us, um, there is a mindfulness that goes into this. So, and I think it's a matter of developing the rapport to understand um, you know, each of the, the market teams that we work with to, to get a sense of where they're at. So there were times when, um, when they just flat out said, hey, we, you know, we can't talk about this right now. We've just got too much going on. And that was cool. That's, you know, that was it. We didn't talk anymore. We'd wait a few weeks, you know, see how the wave went and then get back in touch and see what was going on. So I think, honestly, it, it's just, it's a basic um, human communication. There, I think there was no question in anybody's mind that nobody wanted to cause harm. You know, nobody wanted infections to go up. Nobody wanted to see more falls. But the reality is, is that you know we're dealing with um, different staff situations. You know, our own staff being ill, having to bring in uh, you know traveler staff. And, and everything else. I mean, I don't even, I would not presume to be an expert on what was going on on evenings and nights or weekends at any one of our hospitals, but I can imagine being a nurse myself um, how stressful it is. And I think that you just got to go with it. 
What was interesting is that um, in honoring sort of the need of each market at the time when they needed to say, okay, we can't talk about this right now, um, and waiting a couple weeks and then coming back, I think that just, um, again, sort of made it clear that we knew we were in this together. But somebody kind of had to be the Jiminy Cricket and say, okay, yeah, we know you're up in this, but can you talk about this? Can you talk about what you're doing? And that's really what it came down. We weren't telling them to do it, but can you talk about it? Let us document what you're doing. So I think there's no one answer to that question except um, as human beings is we just have to to uh, continue with the rapport that we've developed and recognize that we're not going to know the situation, but recognize that we're dealing with people who've gone into healthcare because they want to relieve suffering and help, and you can count on that. <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll add just a, I completely agree, Elaine. Just a couple additional comments. Um, it was really, and I again, I wish I I could work with Elaine on every PI project. I just found this one to be she she made it so um, logical and um, really she was a heavy lifter of. Um, maintaining really the state of the state for the enterprise for, for this PI work. And um, each market had identified um, different countermeasures. So it was just, like you said, reluctance to simplify what was, we knew was the not one fits all markets. Um, someone maybe identified equipment that was a barrier. Another one you know, needed to implement um, standardized rounds. So, so that was really, you know, personalized for gave us opportunity for them to, to really look at their own processes and personalize it. Great. Thank, Thank you for Sam. the thought. Um, a, a similar question on, on striking the right balance that we got here. Um, I'm, I'm going to do my best to read this. Um, how does one balance the resist, to temp, resist temptation to simplify and sensitivity to operation? So, to be more specific, if the current process is not scalable or is causing backlogs and it's unable to service the needs in a timely manner, wouldn't one want to simplify or streamline the process? So, so again, what's the balance there between resistance to simplify and sensitivity to operation? I think it's a, it comes back to the issue of, you know, how do you look at that um, resisting that simplification? I don't think anybody uh, disagrees with the idea that you want to streamline things, but that resistance to simplify really has comes down to more of understanding what are the underlying causes of what's going on. So if a process isn't working and you're getting backlogs, it's understanding what is the cause of that. And that's what they're saying in that resistance to simplify is, um, if you think of sort of the iceberg picture, and when we see a problem, we're seeing the top of the iceberg. Well, you, you can't go and try to fix the top of the iceberg. You have to go down underneath the surface and look at what is supporting that manifestation. So the real problems are not what you're seeing. The real problems are what's underneath. That's what you want to find out. Why is the backlog occurring? What you know? What are the? What's going on that's allowing that to happen? So that's what that resistance to simplify is really trying to get at: is understanding not what you're seeing, but not what's behind it, and then fixing that. And and in my experience is that in um, wanting to fix that you are looking at kind of the lean tools of, you know, decreasing rework and, um, you know, streamlining and sort of in the classic kind of way. And that's where I think um, being sensitive to the, you know, your operation comes in because you want to make that process work for the people that are working it. Yeah, and that's, I think, the balance. I hope I've explained myself well enough. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, switching gears a little bit, a question around um, communicating, engaging, working with leadership. Um, 
So the one question is, you know, how does the work translate to almost like a dashboard or a scorecard that's more executive level? And then, and then, you know, what what are folks using to report out to leadership, where the information is comprehensive, um, you know, truthful, but of course, to think for for executives. Mm -hmm. I can take a stab at that, Elaine. First, mm -hmm. if you're okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So working on, on different initiatives, I realize uh, some people prefer executive summaries. Of course, we all have our data. Uh, and, and to be honest, Kaiser has a national nursing dashboard, and then we have regional dashboards. We have hospital-level dashboards. So it's all um, similar. Um, so one of the things that I think was very um, useful uh, for this initiative, first of all, the problem statement. If, you, if everyone's aligned with the problem statement, that really serves as your introduction, um, your um, updates in your executive summary, and then the step seven. Uh, so Elaine and I w would often coach and work with our, our regions to say, this is not just an enterprise report out. This is actually something that is dual purpose. You should be able to use it for your regional leadership as well. And that really, you know, so they're not, not having rework, been able to use parts of that A3. You can populate the, 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 the template, but we found that that really gave too much information. So we, we, we used bits and pieces of it um, to really standardize the second leadership update. Anything else, Eileen? No, I, I was going to say, in my mind, the, the dashboards hit you at step three when you set a target. So there's um, generally a between the target that, um, like this project took, versus what the senior leaders were looking for on their dashboard. Um, sometimes you take that, those dashboards and put them on your step three target. And then you circle back around at step seven, where as the data is coming in, you tie it to to the work that's going on. Um, sometimes one slide on just showing, here we are in relation to the target, this is the work that's happening. One slide can um, say it in about 15 seconds of viewing it. It'll answer the leader's questions. Sure. Thank you for that. Um, jumping around a little, a little bit, we have a question on Smartsheets. Um, so if, um, if if folks don't have a license to Smartsheets, um, you know, how, how do they access some of that dashboard and reporting? Well, curiously enough, with Smartsheets, um, the only people that need licenses are those that are setting up the Smartsheets that are, you know, adding columns or rows. But the access to the Smartsheet dashboards is open to anybody in the organization. You don't need a license to either um, uh, to look at the dashboard, nor do you need a license to, to fill in information. So if you're on the team, um, the team members who are reporting on different rows of the Smartsheet don't need a license to access and put their information in. Somebody does have to have a license, though, to use it in an organization. You have to have at least one person, though. That is true, to set up a smart sheet. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm looking at some of the pre-submitted questions here for a moment. So apologies if you guys address some of these in your, in your chat. Um, but there's one here on uh, how is your theory different from transforming healthcare leadership, a systems guide to improve patient care, de decrease costs, and improve pop health? You know, um, I went back and kind of looked at that. Um, I can't say that I read the book from cover to cover, <laughs> but it did appear to me um, that I think what we're doing w would be supportive of that whole system of understanding. I, I noticed in the, uh, I think it was in Chapter 1, where the authors talk about um, we seen the seemingly impossible made possible by healthcare organizations that challenge these myths and improve quality while cutting costs by achieving the following. Less rework, less waste, increased collaboration. And I, I think that really um, eight-step problem solving and using the A3 as a communication tool 
is just supportive of of what is being taught or or recommended in that book. I don't think it's really different. Sure. Here's one for you guys. How can you share can you share strategies to effectively implement and sustain HRO principles without necessarily affecting efficiency? It's been a little bit of a theme, but a direct question. Well, I think that, <laughs> I think we're trying to do that. Um, you know, standpoint is say preoccupation with failure, I'd say um, focusing on near miss reporting. I think most organizations are doing that. You're, you're that. Um, resisting the temptation to simplify is, you know, using some kind of root cause analysis, failure mode effects analysis, or something that will allow you to basically look at what is supporting the problem, what's allowing it to happen. And I, I think organizations do that without hearing, you know, with their workflow. Mm -hmm. um, the to to oh, yeah, go ahead, Pam. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I, I recall some of the leadership discussions, really, when we're, we're advocating HR is not a thing. So it's not an additional um, set of tools, really, once it becomes embedded in how you do the work, I don't think it would really conflict with efficiency. But um, again, that's, that's the goal, should, should be seamlessly integrated. So I'm looking at the clock here. I think we probably have time for one more question. It's around just implementation and kind of sustaining the change and the follow through. So the question goes, you know, this person's had success with the eight step projects but has found that once a team has implemented countermeasures, they move on and or get distracted by the next item, the next burning item that's on their to-do list or their pile. Um, so the question is, how do we keep the team engaged to gather the post-change data and implement those sustainment strategies um, and not necessarily move on to the next, next thing, per se? <laughs> Well, that is a challenge. That that's a, that's an excellent question. I think that uh, kind of what Pam and I find is is you is it's um, it's that human desire to chat, right? And so, um, from our standpoint, uh, we just get in touch with the teams. You know, we keep in touch with them every couple of weeks. Call them, email them, ask how things are going. Um, there is that reporting schedule that uh, when they know that they are reporting to senior leaders, that's also, you know, it's a structure that helps uh, keep focused on the purpose. But I really do think it is setting up that rapport with the team. You know, if they've, they've gotten to know you as you've been developing, you know, whatever method you're using, you know, there might be some kind of a report out document and as you're helping them to fill that out or supporting them or, you know, whatever it is, I think it's that rapport that keeps it going. I agree. And, and I'll just add, when, when there is an end, so even though we, we speak to this three-year journey, we do have some markets that, that are very close to um, achieving, exceeding their goals and their countermeasures have been implemented and effective. So once we see those results, um, then it is a monitoring phase, and, and, and they're proud to be continue to be recognized for that. And it's not a lot of work um, to continue to, to refresh that and update that and while they tackle the next um, burning platform, if you will. Oh, good sure. point. Well, I think we're just at about time. So, Elaine, Pamela, thank you so much for the last hour. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining. Just a quick reminder um, as we wrap up here, do not forget about um, the steps that you need to take for your CE credit, um, creating the account, and also texting within the next 24 hours. Um, and then please do reach out to any of us if you have questions, comments, concerns. I think there are a couple more questions that are coming in the chat, and hopefully we can follow up with you uh, offline. Sorry we could not get to all of them. But 
we do want to make sure everyone does get out of here on time. So thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's webinar. You may now disconnect and log off.